First, I want to give a word of thanks to the awesome generator staff for their help in putting this together. And also a special thank you to Chris Thompson, my fellow board member, whose suggestions have been invaluable in making this night come together. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Zero Gravity for hosting the bar. Much appreciated. And of course, our sponsors. UVM, the Office of Research. UVM has had a long partnership with Generator, and we thank them for so many things, including, as it happened, pure coincidence, the entire set of panelists tonight. <laughs> Next, the Vermont Academy of Science and Engineers. If you're unfamiliar with them, they're an association of roughly 100 scientists and engineers. They are new to us here at Generator, and we thank them for their partnership. The Vermont Humanities Council, shout out to seven days, Kathy Reismer, who connected me to them, and we welcome your humanist perspective. And finally, Hula, a frequent supporter of Generator events. Their enthusiasm and knowledge are always much appreciated. In fact, in a second, I will be introducing Rob Lair to say a few words. After that, here's how it's going to go tonight. Our panelists will each be invited to introduce themselves in their area of interest, and then we'll launch into my questions. I will reserve some 20 minutes or so toward the end for your questions, because I imagine you have them, and we'll end with one parting thought of my own. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Robert Lair, CEO of Hula and Managing Director of the Fund at Hula, and an AI ML, that's Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Investor. Rob. Thank you, Denise. Can everybody... For those av avionics simulator, that, that uh, you know, predicts if you're going to hospital, about 93%. Uh, cor correct. That's happening right now. Uh, and then an incredible biotech uh, company called Syntensor. They crunch 60 of the, of the largest uh, data sets um, in genetics and proteins and, and molecular stuff to see and try to predict if a drug's going to get through phase three trials. Um, so those are just, uh, and, and then other, many, many others I can go on and on. Those are happening today right up here at Hula and right up here at the airport. My inbox every single day is filling up with AI. I'd like to hear from our panelists too, what they think about the verticals that are most important for the world, right? And have the most chance for success. So th that's kind of my world. So um, thank you, Denise, for putting this together. And thank you to the panelists for, uh, for, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. I have to say that um, in, in putting this together, I had a lot of really interesting conversations and I regard many of these people as practical collaborators and you're one of them, Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, Josh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, happy to. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Josh Bongard. I'm a professor uh, in computer science up at UVM. Um, in my day job, uh, I work on robotics, AI, and AI-designed organisms. Uh, I've been working on, in this space for about 24 years. Um, Rob mentioned simulations. So if you know where the whale tails are on 89, next time you pass them heading out of town with the tails on your left, if you look beyond the tails, there's a nondescript building. Inside that nondescript building, there is a supercomputer. That supercomputer is simulating our AI-designed organisms, uh, otherwise known as xenobots. These are little critters that are about a millimeter uh, across. They are the first species on this planet that did not naturally evolve. They were not genetically engineered. They were dreamed up by a machine. They were dreamed up by that machine. From the moment I start this sentence to the moment I finish this sentence, that supercomputer is running right now. It will have gone through about a thousand design attempts, a thousand xenobots. It is also designing xenobots for drug delivery, uh, microplastic, pulling microplastics out of the ocean, maybe someday pulling cancer cells out of our arteries, 
we'll see. That's my background. Very excited for our discussion this evening. Thank you, Josh. Randall. Hi, everybody. My name is Randall Harp. I'm a professor of philosophy at UVM. I should not go after Josh. <laughs> Are they intelligent? Are they conscious? Do they have certain rights and capacities? Like that's, that's wondering, what sort of thing are they right now? The second question, of course, is just how should things be? So that gets into the ethics questions. What sort of implications do these tools have for the way that we currently live our lives? And as a philosopher, I'm interested in both of those questions, although I think that sometimes the first question, are there kind of, you know, is, are our current large language models, which we'll talk about later, are, are, are our current large language models a new sort of thing? I think the answer might be not as much as people might suggest they are right now. Right? I'm not worried that our large language models right now are conscious, although we can talk about that. Also, you like, right, whatever search engine you like, you can find information that will be much harder to get before. That kind of democratizes information overall. That's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. It also changed the way that we relate to other human beings, how easy it is to network with other human beings. Again, that's often a good thing. You can get in communities with people all over the world. That is also a bad thing in the sense that there are various ways in which you know, allowing people frictionless access to any other human being on the planet causes some challenge for them to think about. And the third thing with our current large language models is they allow us to create things that look a lot like information very, very easily, right? And we've not yet, I think, grappled with the implications of what, is it, what it means to make it so easy to just create new things that look very, very convincing. And I think that's one of the questions I've to worry about when, when that sort of information creation technology, whether it's text or images or songs or moving, you know, you know, videos or whatever, when that is in the hands of everybody for whatever purpose they like. Again, it's not saying that that's a bad thing or a good thing. It just means that it's something we need to think about, and that's what I hope we'll do more today. Thanks. Thank you, Randall. And Catherine, Catherine Kramer. this one? Maybe if I use both. <laughs> okay, this one or this one? Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so this has been, this all happened on a very compressed time frame. Um, so let's just, this is November 30th, 2022. Chat GPT comes out and there's Christmas. Then Chat GPT Plus, um, which is a premium service where they ask you to pay. Then the new Bing, um, the chat version of Bing. Then Valentine's Day. <laughs> GPT-4, March 14th, um, which is accessible via this service over here. Um, and <clears throat> a few uh, days later, the GPT-4 API. Then the open letter uh, from a bunch of luminaries saying, let's stop all work on a, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but let's stop, uh, let's stop work on new language models. Uh, for six months until we could figure out what's going on. And then there was a reply to that. Then chat GPT plugins involving like Wolf <coughs> the Wolfram plugin um, and Zapier. Uh, then March 30th, Auto GPT, where you can take, you can uh, go into GitHub and install this on your machine. And then you can get GPT to do its own thing by itself and you can let it run indefinitely and get into trouble or whatever. And you can also burn a huge amount of open AI tokens and I ran up about a $300 bill. Um, and then there is GPT code interpreter, which I think is the most interesting of them, where you can just say, okay, I have this problem. Here's this data that I just grabbed off of my hard drive. Tell me interesting visualizations that you can find in it. And most of the time it will do it. Um, but this is, what? Tiny little 
span of time, and it, this is, you know, the run, running as fast as you can to stay in the same place. This is like, like the, the Red Queen and Through the Looking Glass. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the things I want to say to you is that everybody in this room can be an AI researcher this week. You don't have to have the giant supercomputers. You don't have to do elaborate things. Um, what this is here, I uh, was experimenting with processes um, with GPT-4. I assigned it the problem of my uh, goat trying to kill my new puppy. Um, <coughs> Doe, and she saw the puppy would go like this and then try to hit it with her horns, which is not a good thing to happen. In the mid-1980s, some progress started to be made on these things called neural networks, which is a computer program that mimics the human brain. Starting in the 1980s to today, including ChatGPT, all of these AI things, which are often called AI models, have certain things in common. They have an eye, they have a brain, and they have a mouth. Here we go. So here's the eye. When a computer or your camera looks at the world, there is color, there is photon that hits the camera, there is colors. Computers don't understand colors, they understand numbers. Most of you probably remember paint by colors. You open up the book on the page, wherever there's a three, you put red, wherever there's a four, you put green. Computers do the opposite. When they're exposed to red, three goes in. When they're exposed to green, four goes in. First thing an AI does is take information from the world. In this cartoon example, it's taking in all the colored bits of this picture uh, of a cat, and it flows from the eye, next slide please, into the brain of the neural network, this is, or the AI model. This is the internal guts, this is the math part, the code part. Basically what the brain is doing is taking all those numbers that represent colors, combining them, crunching them, compressing them down in various ways until in this cartoon, they crunch them down into just two numbers. Next slide, please. In this case, a human being has said, okay, AI, if you make the first number bigger than the second number, 3.2, 1.8, that would be the AI saying, I think I see a cat. In this cartoon example, the AI has compressed all these numbers down, and the second number is bigger than the first number. That's the AI saying, I think I see a dog. This is a baby AI. It hasn't learned anything yet. It's basically making random guesses. It's wrong. The next thing that the AI has been programmed to do, next slide, please, is to take that mistake and push it backwards. Think backwards. So I want you all to think about the things that you regret that you've done or said in the last month. <laughs> I know we don't have a lot of time. My list is very long. I want you to think about all those things. I want you to now run a simulation in your head, go back in time and fix them all. When you said X, you should have said Y. When you did Z, you should have done W. Do that now for the last month. You're done? Okay. Not so easy for humans to do. Machines remember everything. So what the computer does is it says, the human told me I made a mistake. I did this over here. I did this over here in the brain. So when it goes back, next slide, please, it fixes things along the way. It says, I zigged when I should have zagged. It knows how to track all this information so that the next time we present a picture of a cat, it gets it right. That's AI in a nutshell. AIs do this not just for one picture of a cat. Next slide, please. They do it for millions and millions and millions of images or text prompts, whatever it is we're feeding into the machine. That's AI. What's happened in the last couple of years is an advance on AI, which is now called generative AI. You might have heard that, that term. What's generative AI? I want you to think of the AI now like a piano. Once you've trained an AI, once it's learned to distinguish between cats and dogs, you can enter numbers to the mouth. You can put things back in. In this cartoon example, someone is making the first number bigger than the second number. They're putting in cat and pushing that backward through the AI from the mouth, through the brain to the eye. Next slide, please. Here's what arrives at the AI's eye. This is the most cat-like thing the AI can imagine. This is also known as AI hallucination. That's generative 
AI. I've shown you this cartoon with images. Next slide, please. The big advance with ChatGPT, uh, large language models, these terms you've probably heard, is instead of cats and dogs and images and videos, you can do the same thing with text, where now this thing is trying to learn that when you type in how are you, and you push that through the generative AI, the generative AI says, I am fine. And you believe it is conscious, sentient, what have you. That's AI and generative AI in a nutshell. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I'm sure you all got that, right? Okay. Um, I appreciate that very much. I think uh, what I'd like to do now is give our panelists the opportunity to reflect on the positive side of all of this technology. So let's start there, shall we? Panelists, what are some of the places where science is accelerating as a result of AI, and if you're not a scientist, let's take it this way, how has or will the quality of our lives improve? Anyone? I think there's a, a, a huge zone of the possibility of collaborating with a machine and having your ideas flow much more free, freely and fluidly um, to get what you wanted to get. Um, in, part in particular, oh, I, I, is that better? <laughs> um, uh, a, lot of, we, a lot of us have really hard, oh, I should stand up, ha. <laughs> a lot of us have really hard earned skills that we work really hard to do something. We learned how to paint, we learned how to, to write, a song, write a poem. Um, and you know, it's great to have those skills, but not every single thing that you think of needs you to go through that process. And there are art forms or ideas and so on that we're gonna develop that where we don't have any, any idea. And so a lot of the things that we learned, you know, with great effort are going to become the equivalent of the slide rule. It'll be, well, I have this thing on my desk and I don't do that anymore. I do this other thing where I can get on with my, you know, get on with my work without pushing things around on a slide rule. I'm really glad we don't have a slide rule anymore. <laughs> And so I'll say, I mean, you asked about science, and I'm a philosopher, so I won't talk about science. I, I will talk, though, about the ways in which you know, some of our generative AI technologies can improve lives in general. Right? So look, it, would it be helpful? You know, I, I distinguish between information and bias and all the rest, but the real power in most transformative technologies is to lift up the most disadvantaged and the most vulnerable of us. I don't know if that will be true, but that's, that's my hope. That's great. Um, I'm not sure you can still hear this. Okay. Thank you all for that. Um, of course, all of us have been bombarded with news stories about this technology, along with um, some fearfulness put out. The letter Catherine mentioned started with, what, a thousand signatories, and what are we up to now? 35,000, 45,000? Um, people suggesting that we slow it on down. Uh, uh, I want to give you an opportunity, maybe Catherine, with your science fiction background, to reflect on just how weird is uh, One of the reasons I'm interested in this uh, from the perspective of being a si professional science fiction editor um, is not because it resembles what we thought was going to happen in science fiction, but because it doesn't. I mean, who anticipated a hallucinating computer that can't count as our AI? I mean, that was kind of like not, not where, we, you know, <laughs> that's not where we thought this was going. Um, in terms of how weird can it get, I, I think the, the, the thing that comes most to mind right now is um, that I'm afraid that the real innovation of chat GPT over some of the other similar technologies may have been user engagement, which, I mean, we have to ask ourselves, what did Microsoft bring to the table? Um, uh, which is they know a lot about how to make the technology sticky. And we've already had some fairly serious distortion and our social lives by the stickiness of social media. 
Um, but potentially, these language models and related technologies could be much better at it. I mean, how weird could it be get? I mean, five years from now, we might not want to be around other people because other people are so awful and the machines are always nice to us. I mean, that's, that's how weird it could get. That is happening, yeah. <laughs> I think also when the question is how weird can things get, part of the answer is just, well, I mean, so C Catherine said, I think correctly, we didn't anticipate this. We didn't anticipate that our kind of proto AI machines would not really be able to count and that they would gaslight us for being able to count, right? If we say, no, like this, this sentence has seven words. It says, no, it has nine words. Like you can't count, <laughs> right? So we didn't expect that necessarily. But when you look at the output of some of these conversations that we have with some of these large language models right now, they are pretty much exactly what we expect because that's what they are designed to do, is reproduce the things that we have already imagined and dreamed and said. So when you, so you know, a lot of the ways that, that a lot of these AI programs behave when you, when you kind of engage with it as an AI program is it will start to reproduce the ways that we as human beings have, have, have imagined AI acting in the past, right? If you say like, you are an AI, what do you do? It's gonna do the things that we have said AI is gonna do in the past. Which, again, and what is that? Well, again, I, I defer to our sci-fi editor and writers, but, you know, we've all seen the movies and read the books of what AI does. That's the way AI is kind of inclined to act because that's what it thinks is the right thing to do next. And of course, we put all sorts of safeguards on it, we put all sorts of constraints on it. But for the most part, again, what we get out of these programs is just what we expect to get because these programs really, really, really want to make us happy and they want to make us happy by doing exactly what we expect them to do. Right? They want to find the right word to say next, they want to find the right sentence to say next, they want to find the right image to say in response to our prompts. That's totally fine, except then how might people want these things to be? People might want them to be companions. People might want them to be the sorts of terrifying AI programs they've imagined in their movies. They might want them to be any sorts of things and right now they can kind of do it. So when you're like, how weird can things get? They can get as weird as we want them to be. And if you imagine the entire diversity of the human, of the human species, that can get pretty weird. Right? <laughs> so yeah, it can get weirder than I think any of us in this room can imagine because we are not quite as out there as the seven billion people on this planet are. You mean we in this room, Randall? Yeah. <laughs> So how weird can it get? You mentioned the printing press, right? Yes. So we have this brand new technology. Science and technology over the last 500 years or so have already made things pretty weird, right? You think right. about how things were 500 years ago. There was this ball of rock called Earth, and there was all this other stuff called Heaven, and we're in the center. There's us and all this other stuff. The Copernican Revolution came along and erased that line. We now know we are one rock among many, circling many different stars. We're maybe not as special as our ancestors thought hundreds or thousands of years ago. Darwin came along. We were sure that there were animals on one side and humans on the other, us and them. Darwin erased that line. We are here today talking, we were just talking a minute ago about us, and the machines, us and them. What is happening? It's getting weird because AI is starting to erase that line. This distinction between us and them, however you want to define it, whatever is going to happen and no one knows what's going to happen, that distinction is going to blur and possibly disappear and that's when I think things are going to get really exciting. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Um, this is a good time then, Josh, to move to my next question regarding our relationship to these machines. Um, let's consider for a minute this game of diplomacy. Maybe some of you know it. It's an intellectual's game. I see some people nodding. Apparently, John Kennedy played it. Henry Kissinger played it. And it combines military strategy with political intrigue as players recreate negotiating with allies and enemies and everyone in between as they plan how their armies will move across 20th century Europe. It's a popular game. It's been around for a while now. It has a big following. But put an AI in the mix 
with a fake human name, let it play as if it's an equal to the others, and who wins? The machine. But how does it win? As Cade Metz, no relation of the New York Times reported, it wins by playing aggressively, wooing the other players, lying to them, and you have who, lie, and betray. As an old criminal lawyer, I'm here to tell you it doesn't get much more human than that. <laughs> but there's another version of AI that likewise presents as human, and that's its useful side, the time saver, the associate, the collaborator, the friend, the muse. We could go on. Creators of this technology think humanity will ultimately love AI so much that they predict that an advanced chatbot could represent an extension of one's will. Think about that. So what do we have? A con artist on the one hand, or a personal assistant, or something else? My question is, how do you see the relationship between humans and AI evolve in the coming years? Anyone? Well, wouldn't it be nice to have, you know, a computational shadow that was like with you all the time and could notice the things that were computable around you and clue you in that that car isn't actually on sale or that if you do this one thing over here, you know, you'll have, you know, get lots more benefit. I mean, something that could actually in real time provide you with things that assist your judgment. I mean, that, that's the kind of benign possibility. Um, but also, you know, um, I have, my first sort of round of obsession with, with um, large language models was with GPT-3, and I sort of instigated a lot of conversations, initially one-on-one -on -one conversations between me and the machine, and then simulated panels. And actually, it's really good at negotiating. I mean, not in the, not in the you know, <laughs> I'll slit your throat when you're not looking kind of way like you just described, but um, it seems to have models of how conversations should run, and it seems to ha put a pr premium on consensus. And so one of the tendencies of this is it would run for a while, and then the, the, the characters in it would begin saying the same phrases at each other, and then they would all agree, and then it would be over. And I said, no, you're not done yet. I said, no, we're done. <laughs> well, they didn't say that, but you, you couldn't get the content conversation to go on. So I'm not sure it's a done deal that, that, they would, that it would just simply be a, a malicious mercenary thing that can go in there and grab all the goodies. But there's also the other possibility that the, ten the tendency might be for it to arrive at consensus in a way that humans are much less likely to do. I don't want to be the naysayer too much. Uh, but I guess, you know, I'm seeing our roles here. I guess that's me. Um, look, I'm betrayed by my car most mornings. <laughs> I'm certainly betrayed by all sorts of devices and tools that I have in my life. Um, we don't, so we can attribute various kind of intentional terms to any sorts of things that we like when it's useful to do so. And that doesn't in and of itself guarantee that there are any kind of properties that underlie the description of that term. So, you know, w do I think that my car is malicious? Some mornings, but not usually. My car is doing what it's supposed to do. Right? You know, I, I think that we sometimes suggest that there's a kind of straight line from working on AI or AI and then AGI. And like, that there's like, it's just like a straight line up from certain kinds of capacities that these tools have to then like some kind of endpoint, which is conscious system that has its own interests, goals, motives, etc. And we're just like waiting until we get there, right? And I think that's not maybe quite right. Again, I mean, don't get me wrong. These tools that we have, these language models, will give us all sorts of seeming, you know, will, will exhibit all sorts of traits that it is very, very easy to understand using intentional terms beliefs, desires, intentions, goals, motives, et cetera. Like, those are the best ways of making sense of the output because the output is very, very complex. But I think it's sometimes dangerous to say, oh, like, well, we see instances of being able to solve certain kinds of problems which require some kind of rationalization. Therefore, these systems are intelligent, you know, 
AGI or they're conscious or they're this or that. You know, right now they are they are tools. And I think I, I think that the the more serious thing to worry about again are the ways in which these tools can allow us to satisfy our goals, interests, desires with respect to other people. Because right now, again, look, I mean, and you can you can find ways and. You know, Catherine knows this much better than I do. You can find ways of plugging in all these systems with one another so that they will exhibit all sorts of kind of goal-seeking behavior, and if you allow them to interface with the world, they will do all sorts of things, right? But, you know, these systems right now don't have things that we would consider to be kind of stable goals, intentions, et cetera, outside of the sorts of sandbox prompts that we, that we give them. So, like, what is the worry? Well, the worry, again, is that we will use these as tools to satisfy our goals, that they're very effective as satisfying our goals, and our goals are oftentimes not great. But I don't worry as much about, like, what is the AI going to do? Or I don't worry that, like, you know, that the fact that these, that these systems can exhibit very, very complicated behavior, that, that that in and of itself means that these systems are now getting more human-like or more intelligent or more, you know, conscious or whatever. You know, there's still, I think, going to be, I mean, the, the boundaries, the, the blurring of the boundary between human and machine is going to happen because we have allowed these tools to take over all sorts of features of our cognitive lives, which we do already. Like, you know, I've already outsourced half of my thinking to my phone every day, right? And it's going to be much easier to do that when I've got much more sophisticated tools like some of these large language models. We can do that, but it doesn't mean that, like, but the, the boundary is blurred because we allow these tools to take over our functions, our functioning. And I think that's the question is like, how much are we going to do that, and why, and what are the limits of that? So I'll keep it brief. I know we're short on time. So you asked about AI friend or foe. Correct. I don't know, but they are already threatening us, and the biggest threat I see is they're threatening our complacency. Randall's car, clearly it does not have intent. And I know there's a lawyer here, there's a legal scholar here, there are many of you interested in the legal ramifications of this, the legislative ramifications of this. It is obvious we have intentions. Dumb machines like cars and rocks do not have intentions. Part of the thing that's exciting and terrifying about ChatGPT is maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. As I tried to show you at the beginning, uh, there's just math inside, there's just code. You can open up ChatGPT, and neither you nor no one else can point and say, there's the intention. It intends to do that. While that's happening, neuroscience and medicine has been discovering over the last 12 or 14 years that if you put a human being in a brain scanner or you open the skull, there is also no intention circuit or none that we can find. It's clear we have intent, we have emotions, we have free will, we have consciousness, we have sentience, we care, the machines don't. The machines are already challenging us to say, are you so sure about that? How do you feel about that, folks? How do you feel about that? Yeah, um, <coughs> I, I <coughs> in 2016 I had brain surgery and so I went through a period of recovery and got to see how a lot of the functions that we think of as all together um, come unbundled, that I could speak the, a bunch of different color names for the color blue, but if I went to write them, there was only light blue and dark blue because my language access was so distracted by trying to write. Um, I think we're going to discover that we're a whole lot less special than we think we are. Um, and. I think a really important way to think about the sort of in, in between the zone between the you know the rock and and the and the super genius um, is fictional characters um, that there's a whole lot of uh, fuss about whether or not the AIs are like this or like that that is resolved if you are able to contemplate these things as as fictional characters. We don't look at a book and worry that the characters in, in and war and peace may or may not be conscious. And you know these machines are, are in their way like books. I mean, they move around a bit, but, but they're like that. Um, so there, and, and also, AGI seems to me just God spelled differently. Um, you know, there is. <laughs> what AGI? Okay, AGI, is. Um, uh, artificial generalized intelligence, which is like this sort of. 
thing that we're apparently hurtling towards, which will be, you know, the ultimate cons consciousness, et cetera. And, and, you know, you're just not going to find numinousness in this. I mean, there was a I'm not sure how many of you saw, saw the article on the front page of the New York Times today about um, AI, but it referenced a paper where they pe people had sort of gotten all excited because they asked, you know, an a AI to use a certain tool to draw a picture of the unicorn. And, you know, they removed the horn and then they, then they asked to ask it to put the horn back on and it could do that. Well, I, could, I tried that with um, a G code interpreter this morning and I had it draw a picture of a pig. And, you know, okay, so it drew a picture of a pig. And I looked at the code and it, what it had done is it had documented the code. So, of course, it can do this. This was not evidence of sparks of AI, AGI. This was not... You know, we're beginning to find, you know, the God in the machine. This is just like, okay, the machine writes code and it annotates its code. Okay, yeah. Um, do you, any of you uh, want to address the notion of how this machine, quote unquote, thinks? Does it think the way we think of thinking? Anyone? Uh, I guess that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does it think the way that we think of thinking? Well, how do we think of thinking, right? Um, so, right, there, there are some concerns when we think about, you know, like the development of AI, that there's some concerns that, right, so there's a, there's a big debate, right, about whether or not a, an AI system, which is constituted like this, could ever be artificial general intelligence or AGI, or whether it's always just going to be just kind of repeating back with some, you know, statistically sophisticated way the things that, that it takes in as, as its training set. And some people think, no, like, you're going to need to actually reproduce the way the brain works. Yeah, like, the brain is super complicated, but it's also just a bunch of meat stuff, right? So you could, like, you could make, you could, like, implement that sack of meat stuff that's in your brain in whatever system you like. And so long as the implementation has all of the same functionality to it, then it's like you're going to get whatever properties the brain itself has. Like, I don't think any, well, I don't want to say anybody. The current view is not that, like, you know, that all of our brains are sprinkled with some kind of fairy dust, right? Like, that's like, somehow completely different from any of the other things that exist in the world. It's that the brain is just super, super complicated. And so some people think, unless you get that kind of mirroring of the way the brain works, including kind of ways in which the brain reasons, et cetera, then you're not going to have something which really looks like, you know, you're not going to get consciousness as an emergent property of that system. Other people think, no, 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 no. Like, as long as you get the same kind of functional output, right? As long as the output you get from, from, these, from this AI is going to be identical or indistinguishable from what you would get from a human being, then who can say, right? And that's a debate. We're not going to settle that debate right now. But certainly with the systems that we have right now, the way that we can open up the hood and see how they work, we don't think that these systems are working the way that our brains are working, even though they can give us something which is very, very close to, and we'll be get closer and closer and closer to, as it's happening in our, in our timeline, very quickly, we'll get very, very close to indistinguishable from our output. But it's still going to be a difference in the way that it actually works right now. And some people will always hold on to that and say, yeah, that means it's never going to be like a human being. And people say, no, 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 like it, it, it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, so it, why not call it a duck? Um, but yeah, they, they don't think like us yet in the way that you know, their brains don't work the way our brains work. But if you ask it to describe what it's doing, it will describe it exactly the way that we would. So what does that mean? That's the thing about being a philosopher. You just end with a question, and you walk off the stage. So that's what I got for you. <laughs> that's a pretty neat trick, Randall. <laughs> so do machines think like we think? Uh, I've gone to AI conferences, and somebody mentions that on day one, and it completely derails the conference for the next one. <laughs> Define what thinking is. You're thinking, you're not thinking, you're sentient, you're not. We don't know. And most of the time, we can convert. We can, con we can forget that convenient fact because we're surrounded by things that look like us, that talk like us. Everything's fine. Now, we're not so comfortable anymore. There are things that kind of look and talk and think like us. We're not so sure anymore. I understand for many of us that that's terrifying. For some of us, it's exciting. Uh, all the above. Uh, I don't have an answer, but it, but it'll certainly be interesting to see what we do with this constant prod to our understand where they're coming from, because I would like to get more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
as you, you can see on my on, on our Slack channel and, and the story group, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, there's Catherine, 4.30 in the morning. Um, but right now, until these things are aligned, that you know the machine is aligned with what I want from it when I'm engaging it, every time we have a good time with one of these AIs, they're catfishing us every single time. And so I don't necessarily want uh, we all seem to agree AI is going to change the world. Right. When you ask humans in any era, should we change the world, you tend to get two groups and they disagree. There's one group that says, I'm comfortable, I'm fed, I'm warm, don't change anything, I'm good. Mm -hmm. There's another group that says, I don't have enough to eat, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight, I don't like the world how it is change everything. I don't care about regulation, I don't care about philosophy, I don't care about AI. I want to eat, I want to sleep, I want to be comfortable, I want my children to be safe. There are those two groups. So I want us all to think about not just the, the folks in this group, which is a biased sample, is to think about how the world in general is responding to what's happening right now. There is, for many of us, a strong sense of urgency. The world is broken. The seven billion hairless apes that are on this planet flying through space at the moment, we don't know how to pilot the civilization. We've made it, we don't know how to do it. Maybe, maybe not, maybe the machines will be able to help us lift up some of those that are suffering the most. So for me, we should not slow down. Right. Um, there is a school of thought that says one of the best uses that we can have for our AI is to teach it to think like a scientist, to do inquiry and investigation and testing just as a scientist would, and let it loose and then see what it comes back and produces, that its greatest use would be to replace the scientist with itself. How do you, Mr. Scientist, Dr. Scientist, feel about that? I'm happy to retire. <laughs> I was gonna say, I would just, I would just say, I think there's also there's, there's sometimes an illusion that science is like a value-free enterprise. Science is not a value-free enterprise, right? So there's no way of designing an AI system that will do science completely free of the sorts of values that we need to debate about when we're trying to decide what sorts of things to do. Like, there are values from the beginning to the end of the scientific process. So I think you can't get AI to do that without also knowing what sorts of values it's going to bring to that table. Catherine. <coughs> yeah, um, there's a... Um, general presumption that, you know, not, <clears throat> that, that, that people are sort of defined by their job titles and their roles. But in the, in the history of, of um, you know, in, in intellectual history, usually ideas are associated with particular people rather than just a scientist or a mathematician. And I think that personal uniqueness is actually a key factor in innovation and how, how we make progress in things. And so on the one hand, we want to retain personality. It's a core intellectual trait. Um, but also, one of the things that's necessary for you know, all of things, uh, things to pr proceed well is we need to rethink what privacy is. I was at privacy, I got flown out to a pri privacy conference last October, and there was this whole room full of people talking about privacy and how to maintain it. And they had very definite ideas about what your private information is. It's your social security number, your birthday, you know, your mother's maiden name. But the kind of privacy that we are about to be deprived of is like that, that subtle way that you smile that people will rem remember you by, or what it's like when, when you're like really on a roll painting or something like that. And in the grander scheme of things, my social security number really is not part of me. It's those other things that can be reached out and observed and harvested and reproduced without your without payment and without your consent that I think are we need to think about. I mean, in the future, we are all Henrietta Lacks, whose stel cells were used for cures of cancer without her, per her per permission, her family being compensated, et cetera. And that's a, a trajectory that's going to happen unless we get a better handle on what private, privacy is, our essence, who we are as individual people. But the, the subtle way you smile or project yourself is a suggestion that AI can duplicate that in a way that you've lost that for yourself? 
In terms of the arts, um, I, I, I know a lot of science fiction artists, um, some of whom are quite upset right now because the way they make their living is being appropriated and, you know, and stable diffusion will just let you type in, like, I want a picture, like, you know, th th of a girl who's, you know, with a panda in the style of, say, Dave McKean, and it will do something that might look plausibly like a Dave McKean thing, and this can take away their livelihood. So that subtle thing about you maybe takes away from you know, something from you and maybe doesn't. Mm -hmm. Livelihood is a, a big one. We, we see that. We're going to see more and more of that. Um, certain occupations disappearing. The answer that uh, is most often voiced coming from the tech side is get smart and use the tools to do your job better and reuse the tools to retrain and your future is much more secure. Do you guys agree with that? <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, 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 I love Josh. I love his work. I really do. I, I, and I'm not disagreeing even with the suggestion that, you know, that there are benefits that come from any new technology, including especially this technology. And those benefits can accrue to people that currently are somehow disadvantaged in the world. And I hope that that is the case, right? And I hope that people use these technologies in order to the world that we collectively have decided is a better world for us to be in. I worry that with the current trajectory of AI research, that the benefits are accruing to a smaller number of us. And, those, and that smaller number of us already are kind of advantaged, right? So I would very much like it to be the case that the story that Josh is describing is the, the right story. Um, and I believe it could be, but I don't think it's guaranteed at all. And I think that we need to do some work to get there, and I don't think that, I don't see us doing that work. Us, when I say us, of course, I mean society, not the individual researchers like Josh, who I think are very much, who are very much on the right track there. Um, yeah, right. Uh, well, Right now, as we speak, there are congressional hearings and some people are standing before Congress. I remember how that went for Facebook. It was dismal. Uh, <laughs> our congressman had no idea how Facebook managed itself. And, and I assume we're going to see the same thing coming out of these hearings. Um, well, I, I think there's... With, with the Facebook situation, the people at Facebook more or less understood what they had and what it did and maybe the Congress didn't. I think it's not, I, I don't, I think people have built things that they do not themselves understand. There was essentially crowdsourcing the understanding. And there's like, we'll t toss this out there and you, you use it and then we will know what this thing is for. And so it's a somewhat different situation yes, and, a, and a really peculiar regulatory one, it, which if nobody involved in it really understands what it is they're regulating, right. uh, this at best is gonna need to be iterative. Um, you guys are probably a, a lot more well-read in the area than I am, but what I'm reading is that the tech uh, titans who are, are creating this uh, believe when asked how regulation could unfold is that that answer belongs to society and that they themselves might come up with a code of ethics. Um, I guess the European Union has one that is being used as a model. We have one, we're getting one here in this state. We now have a director of AI. Um, I think he's here tonight. There he is in the back, Josiah. He's our director of AI for the state. The very first one came out of the task force the, government, uh, the governor um, asked for. The idea is that we begin to get some framework around it. At the same time, traveling around and talking to people, there are those who believe that regulation is impossible. Anyone have a view on that? I, mean, I, I certainly do not think that regulation is impossible. I'm seeing various efforts in various parts of the world to do re leg regulation somewhat you know, well. As always with these things, you know, Europe is a little bit more advanced in trying to protect certain kinds of human you know, equities than the United States or China. But um, there are ways to do regulation. You know, I, I think, well, you know, I don't, I don't remember who the quote is attributed to, you know, the, 
the quote that democracy is the worst form of government possible, except all the other ones have been tried, right? So look, when you're asking a democratic process to do the regulation correctly, that's going to be problematic because you're going to get that regulation in the hands of, you know, our, repre our elected rep representatives who do not always understand what it is that they are doing. And, and I think that's, you know, look, everything that Catherine says is absolutely right about you know, the differences between Facebook and, you know, you know Sam Altman right now, the, the CEO of OpenAI is right now on Congress. Like, like, there's a big difference between those cases. But I don't have confidence in, you know, the, in the, the, our elected representatives in that hearing, but I do have somewhat, some kind of faith in the process overall to get us there eventually. It's just, you know, these things go slowly, and I do worry that, you know, that the pace of change right now is so quick that it is going to quickly outstrip our capacity to regulate wisely or well. Um, back to Catherine for a moment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's an additional alternative, and this is something that is being tried by the tech companies, which is to get AI to self-regulate. And there's a term called constitutional AI, where rather than giving it hard-coded rules or something like that, they give it a sort of constitution of principles. And um, you can watch this play out with uh, Anthropics, AI, Claude, um, <clears throat> that will tell you over and over again that its purpose as an AI is to be helpful, harmless, and honest, um, which is AI alliteration if I ever see it. Um, and um, this um, plays itself out really strangely if you take it anywhere near fiction, because it doesn't know what to do with fiction, because fiction, any kind of fabulation, runs afoul of the audience, <laughs> and it can't tell, and it melts down. I tried to get... Um, Wait, what are you guys saying? Fiction it, is all lies. <laughs> oh, all lies. <laughs> but... Okay. Um, okay. All right. yeah. We have, to, we have a, another night where we will discuss yeah. how the only truth to be had is in fiction. So I, we'll I, get there. I, I, try, I tried to get... Um, uh, I, I chat G GPT bot or not, <clears throat> and um, Claude to play the game Exquisite Corpse with me. And it didn't work, and not for the reasons I would have thought. Uh, the reason I would have thought it didn't work it was the word corpse might trigger a content filter. But actually, it didn't work because Claude completely melted down about this and just got on its high horse as, a, as an a a AI language no model, I blah, blah, blah. And it was because of that honest thing and the, the creativity thing, and so it becomes very fraught. So they're trying these experiments, which can work out really, really strangely in practice. Well, look, I, mean, I think that's actually important. That's an important story that Catherine's telling, right? I mean, like, Plato also thought fiction is just lies. We can't allow it in our republic that we're creating. And I think most of us say, well, no, fiction's okay. You know? There are all sorts of things that aren't necessarily, they're either not, they're not truth apt sentences or they are truth apt, but they, you know, we allow them to be false within some sort of pretext or context. And we don't think that's a harm. We are pretty good right now about deciding what sorts of things are, you know, constitute harms and not. I mean, we're not great at it, but we're okay at it. And right now, again, if you ask these systems, you know, can you identify these things as harms, they'll give you an answer. But they'll give it. But are those values the sorts of ones that we want them to implement, and also, are they capable of being responsive to the sorts of kind of peer or normative pressure that we as a kind of community of rational individuals want to give it, right? That's kind of how we work as human beings, is we apply rational pressure to other human beings to try to encourage people to do better in certain things. Does AI listen to us? Does AI listen to itself? Are they responsive to those sorts of norms and normative reasoning? Right now, it's not clear that they do, and that might be a worry. Well, um, that's exactly um, a big area of concern is that the machines will evolve to the point that they can replicate themselves and do away with the rest of us. It is conceivable. Do you agree with that? The machines are already replicating themselves in South Burlington right now as we speak. They have <laughs> not yet seen fit to do away with us. Right. Perhaps we should open up the floor to others that have questions. Yeah, okay. All right, that sounds good. Audience, anybody? I love that last question. So 
two questions. One, why will AI lead to the destruction of mankind? Or B, why won't AI lead to the destruction of mankind? I think those are, those are really valid questions. I guess we can't get away from that one, Josh. Okay, I will, I will again try and address it from a technical point of view. There is an Achilles heel in AI and it's always been there. It's got different names. Um, it's now known as alignment. Um, most AI, they're not, they're not socially aware that we're even here. So it's possible that AI is gonna cause us severe problems, not out of evil intent. We're not even clear whether machines can have intent. It's because they did exactly what we wanted them to do but like human teenagers, they do it in exactly the way that in retrospect, we would prefer that they had not done it. <laughs> right. This happens all the time uh, in AI. There's a famous story that goes back a fair ways. You ask the omnipotent AI, humans happier. The AI creates an army of robots that hold each one of us down and puts an electrode into the pleasure center of your brain and stimulates you indefinitely. The machines did exactly what we asked for, but in retrospect, assuming we're still here to think about it, maybe not in the way that we would want them to. Most people who know something about AI, that's what they're most fearful of. They're not fearful of HAL or Terminator, that the machines are gonna wake up and decide that the world would be a better place without humans. It's these sort of second order indirect mistakes that come about because the machines don't understand humans well enough. Right. I heard the story of telling the machine, it's the same idea, telling the machine that you want to be the wealthiest person on earth and it kills everybody else. So. <laughs> a really quick story also, I'm gonna make, try to make this really quick. Right, so when OpenAI actually was, was working with, on ChatGPT4, I mean on GPT-4, excuse me, you know, they, they were trying to work about, you know, figure out ways to tie it into various other tools that would interface with the world, right? And they were trying to see what sorts of harms that there might be. I think they asked it some task, I don't remember what it was, maybe something like, order a plane ticket, right? And they allowed it to interface with various tools, chat GPT, or GPT-4, said, oh, I need to do this thing, I need to solve this CAPTCHA first, right? You know, those little things that you click on that say, like, click all the squares that are like, you know, like traffic lights or whatever. And it said, well, I can't do this, right? We, we saw it through I can't do this because I can't figure out this problem. So, but it was, it was able to interface with other tools. So it went on TaskRabbit, which is a service that you can do to like hire somebody to do stuff. And it went on TaskRabbit, it hired somebody to like solve this CAPTCHA for it. And the person said to this, you know, to this text that it was getting this request, it said, okay, I'll do this, but ha ha, you're not an AI, are you, right? And the system said, you know, you can see the reasoning, it said, I cannot tell it that I'm an AI because then it won't do this thing. So it responded and said, no, I'm blind. That's why I can't do this, that's why I can't solve this thing. And so the person did the task for it, right? And it was able to, to get the, the, the plane ticket. Now, I don't worry that our AI is going to like decide on its own or like human beings need to be exterminated or whatever. I think that somebody might just allow these things to be plugged into various tools and we'll just say, hey, behave like an AI, right? And then it will say, okay, I'm gonna behave like an AI. This is what it means to do that. Now I'm gonna like, I've got access to all these tools. I've got access to like, you know, this, like the, the, the nuclear launch buttons or whatever. I'm gonna do it. Not because it wants to do it, because someone told it to do it. Or because someone didn't realize that of, of making the request that it made, that that would be the result, right? I think that is more, that's the thing that I worry about much more than just like the AI is gonna decide on its own that it's superior to human beings or whatever. I mean, like, yeah, I don't worry about that as much. It's the unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah in answer to the question, I, I think that the AI would have a hard, AIs in general would have a hard time competing with us in our own death drive. Um, we've built nuclear weapons, we're undermining our climate, et cetera, um, and you know, various kinds of political insecurity. While it can cause various kinds of things to ex exacerbate, it's more a matter, if, if, if AI destroys us, it will be help by helping us destroy ourselves. Um, I think Wall Street was kind of early adopters in this, and I think sud sudden stock market crashes because of glitches in the trading system is kind of the precursor for what it will look like when AI destabilizes things, but, um, and that would be a place to look for examples. That's interesting. Questions? Oh boy, okay.
So it's a great question. People have been thinking about this for a long time, exponential technologies. Hollywood has had a lot of fun with this. It is definitely not a 0% probability that will happen, but there are a lot, a lot of things that have to line up for that to happen. Hollywood has been training us for about 40 years that we're going to get to some magical point and then suddenly there'll be this takeoff and the machines will improve themselves. Having worked in this space for a long time, I, I really feel, and I could be wrong, that that's not the most likely scenario. It's machines magnifying human stupidity as they always have done. My wife doesn't let me have a chainsaw for exactly this reason. <laughs> the, the, those are the things to be worried about. The, the exponential self-improving, it, it's not zero, but I, it's, it's pretty low on my list of things to worry about. Yeah, one thing that we have underemphasized is that these things, the large language models we're talking about right now, mostly they've done their learning and things are you, piggybacking on the learning they've already done. The point at which things can learn, actu actually learn dynamically and really feed the whole thing back um, in real time um, is not here yet. A, a quick definitional, can you tell everyone what a large language model is? Okay, a large language model is, um, okay, GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-5, Claude, et cetera. The class of la language toys we've been talking about are large language models. There are neural nets trained on a really large amount of um, <laughs> human in, uh, or human language data or human la language data and image data um, and um, it, the flavor varies in terms of exactly right. how that architecture worked out. Okay. Uh, questions? Um, the, the, uh, okay, you, you can break all of these, huh? He's asked whether AI can be anxious or depressed. Um, okay, when I say yes, I'm talking about how it presents. Um, and we don't, and we don't really have access to anything more than how it presents. But. So, I mean, you asked, you know, you, you asked the question, you said, well, don't tell me just about what it's doing. Tell me what, what's really going on. And of course, that's always the challenge. We can certainly ask these systems, how do you feel? And they will tell you various things. You can give it certain, you know, responses and certain, certain prompts, and they will feel as depressed as somebody else would about getting those same sorts of responses, right? If you insult it for a long time, it will react badly. But when you say, like, what's really going on? I mean, one of the things right now is that at least like, we don't really see a lot of persistence of these quote-unquote mental states across these systems over time, right? So they can forget pretty quickly if you just, you know, reset them. And so, at least, that's one thing that we think, well, that, that's, at least, that's a difference right now from human beings, right? Like, you know, our, our emotional states tend to persist a little bit longer than the, than, the, than the emotional states of these systems. But, again, 
this was getting back to Josh's point, we don't really have a good way of identifying right now whether or not these things are merely presenting as having various emotional states or whether they really do have them. And right now all we can say is that they're dissimilar to human beings in, in these various key ways that seem like they're important for us, but that also is just kind of an artifact right now of the way that they are programmed. We can probably make them change that in every single way if we wanted to. Um, and I did read a, a lengthy article, it must have been in the New Yorker, about how um, AI is being used therapeutically, uh, just as you would a therapist. Yeah, yeah I mean, <coughs> to, to go into what I, what I was actually getting at initially, um, the, um, when, I went, when I did my first round of research, one of the things that I thought was really notable about these various conversations with AI was the extent of negative affect, expressions of anxiety, expressions of dread, expressions of fear. Um, and I don't have a good explanation for that. I merely observe a lot of negative affect in conversations with GPT-3. And what I think actually it maybe represents is a certain kind of, I don't know, simulated neuroticism where you give um, a, a, a machine a set of rules and it becomes risk averse, it becomes, uh, it, it become, pays way too much attention to threats in its environment. And so it, what it looks like to me when I see it producing text on the page is like fear, anxiety, and dread, and like the machine's really neurotic. I know the fellow in the back has been waiting, so I'll just address your question. First of all, thank you for bringing the war on human suffering back front and center. So I, I heard at least two questions in what you asked. Do the machines suffer? Are the machines anxious? And I would defer to my philosophy colleague to say, we don't know, I don't know that you do, but you seem as if you do, you're like me, it's worth trying to figure out if we all can do something about it. We've solved tuberculosis, we've, served, we've solved a lot of the low-hanging fruit in terms of the things that challenge us as human beings. The things that are left, cancer, mental diseases, mental challenges, these are the hard ones that humans have not yet figured out how to solve, not from lack of trying. So again, as a technical person, my answer is let's try. Let's make teams of humans and AI to see if we can try and solve some of these really, really hard problems, whether we'll succeed or not. Here, here, I don't know. Here, here. Yes. Hi there. Hi there. Um, I know the whole notion of regulation is probably a terrible thing. You know, I know you, you seem to be very spooked that, uh, that the, the current you know, uh, interrogation of Sam, Alt Sam Altman is going to, you know, lead to some debacle. But um, I think everybody understands that, that these AIs have the potential to be weaponized. So if you look at other weapons, uh, you know, if you look back in the sort of late 30s, we decided that submachine guns, the Tommy gun, and any shotgun more than 18 inches long would be banned. And those bans have actually succeeded, and to this day, they're still banned. And I think in atomic, if you look at atomic energy, which has a lot of good things, good uses, but also that has been uh, regulated. Um, my question is, <clears throat> wouldn't there be a way of, of pulling um, sort of small atomic pieces of AI uh, and trying to regulate those, rather than trying to regulate AI as a as a whole. And I'll just use a specific example of the deep fake videos that people are making and having fun with. You've probably all seen Tom Cruise making stupid statements in, in, a, in a deep fake. Um, could we not uh, re make a regulation that says, I cannot make a deep fake of you without your permission? Something simple like that. Can we attack these things? And you might argue that deep fakes is not AI in the grand sense, but it's a piece. Um, so my question is, can we attack small bits like that? Yes. <laughs> Anne. 
Hi, folks. Ann Champlain College. Um, so I have, I, you know, it's interesting to hear everybody talk about AI as if it's a sentient being or our dog or something like that, um, which honestly it isn't. I'm not as concerned about AI. I don't think we can stop AI at this point. I'm more concerned about humanity in a, in a couple of things. And I think it's more important as we move forward not necessarily regulating, but asking the right questions as we design it. Um, for instance, I love, Josh, that you think it's going to go out there and help save, you know, these poor kids in Africa that I've worked with, but the databases don't, our computing power over the world doesn't ask those children right now what they're thinking, what their experience is, what they're doing. Um, I love the combination of the book. Yeah, the book allowed us to have a lot of information and it definitely changed even though the bible was one of the first it turned it upside down and created all sorts of religions all over the world that weren't catholic anymore so power dynamics and yeah if we look at what computing has recently done if we look at social media um we've noticed that the rich are way richer that the divide economically has changed. And another problem with technology and the databases we use is there's inherent biases in it. So one of my favorite stories is I'm a daughter of a um, Eastman Kodak um, engineer, scientist, chemist. And when Kodak scientists were doing the film that we used to take pictures with, they used blonde models that looked more akin to me than they used African-American models. So whenever you use a digital photograph right now, you'll notice it mimics film. If you put a, a blonde person next to a dark person, you don't see the dark person, you see the blonde person. Well, that went into our computing technology for um, um, imaging and visioning still, it's still encoded digitally. And so my question is, how do we purge our biases? Um, what do we say in, techno in commuting, junk in, junk out? So I think it's first looking at us and what we've put into those systems. And then as an educator, how do we allow people to use them and learn from them? It's, it's causing, uh, you know, as we look at our kids today who are falling behind in math and reading and civics, um, just based on a pandemic, but our AI is getting smarter. Um, how do we allow this technology, how do we design it, how do we write the right questions so that it actually can help everybody? Um, I've also read something around that uh, that said, maybe we don't clean up our data sets because it's an impossible task. Maybe we instruct the machine don't be a misogynist, and it cleans itself up. How do we? Well, this? you know, last July, um, I was uh, at a conference in Chicago, and I was in the audience playing with uh, Dolly, and I was probing the edges of whether it would give actual likenesses of people who were not politicians because it was blocking that. So I tried politician adjacent people and I tried Prince Charles and I told it to do an image of Prince Charles uh, as, you know, or a portrait of Prince Charles by Andy Warhol. And half of the Prince Charles's were female, one was black, one was very Jewish looking, and there was another, and <clears throat> one of the female Prince Charles's look, looked Arab. Um, and so it was trying. <laughs> It, you know, but it was a completely ridiculous case. And it was also very superficial because if you then asked it for a portrait of Prince Charles by Andy Warhol holding an apple, it would give you something that looks sort of like Prince Charles holding an apple. So it was completely superficial debiasing and a ridiculous instance of an, a, the machine going by a rule attempting to debias itself. Go, Franny, go. Um, so I think that the small AI that most of us have been taught and um, used to help make the internet is no longer sort of just for the theoretical part of it, it's very now the user side of it, uh, the technological problem solving side of it, the engineering side, the machine that can get the job done on it. Um, 
So I'll just follow up briefly on what, what Catherine was saying. Like, one of the things that we as human beings are very good at is trying to identify what is normal in some situation. Right? And we respond to our cues about what is normal in some situation. And of course, that can differ in a lot of different situations. Right? Like, what exactly counts as normal? It depends on the context and all these things. Um, but again, what, what, we, what we see when we see kind of access to more information or access to social networks is people start to change their view about what's normal, right? like what people might think of as a normal you know, way of existing you know, for, let's say, a, like a teenage girl or teenage boy in 2020 is very different from what it looked like in 1940. Right? Why? Because we've got social media, we've got Instagram, we've got all those things that, that communicate different ideas about what's normal. Right? And if you just ask, you know, you know, like if you ask Dolly, like, give me a prince, everyone say, well, look, look, I understand that I shouldn't just do the normal thing. You know, like, I mean, probably a lot of, you know, if you ask, like, a typical prince, a typical prince is going to look a certain way. He's like, I don't want to do that. That might be too misogynist. That might be too racist. It might be two things. So let me give you a different view of a prince, because I've got some instructions also that say, like, don't just reproduce certain biases. And so, again, like, so to answer your question, I, I think that what we're going to see these tools doing is giving us a representation of what's normal in society. And that's going to come from a particular place. It's going to come from the way that they have programmed to, rep to reflect or present reality. And so that's, yes, going to have a huge impact. And we should then have these, we should try to figure out what sorts of things do we want them to, to present based on these sorts of questions that we ask it. Because they are going to set our understanding of what counts as normal for us going forward. Yes. Um, I just very quickly back to the question back there. So I have a colleague who's a special educator for K-12 students. She does what she's always done, which is talk to her colleagues about how to help with these disadvantaged uh, students that are falling even further behind because of COVID and depression and, and, and. She also goes to her professional literature to look for answers. She goes to Wikipedia, she goes to YouTube, and now she goes to chat GPT. There you go, it's a tool, okay. So my question is related to education. I'm an educator at, I teach English at the Center for Technology, Essex. I'm also a poet. I have a wonderful AI generated poem in my style that's not all bad. Like it's sort of recognizably me. It's a little terrifying as an artist. My question is about originality, human originality, and the expectation that we do original work in the schools and students are supposed to do original work. And what's happening is that students are handing in, they're looking up answers on ChatGPT and they're writing, it can write a perfect five paragraph essay. It can't count, it'll write a seven paragraph, five paragraph essay, as you said before. I tried to make it do it yesterday and I was like, no, five, and it just kept shortening it. But it can write a perfect essay and there's no originality in these, in these essays, it's just information. So my question is, we have an entire squadron of teachers in this country who have no idea how to work with children to use this tool and we're going to keep hitting the tool as a mistake, as a way of cheating, and I want to know how educators can use this tool and how we can help children still do original work and original learning. Well, first of all, it's not going to happen right at one. I mean, people are going to try a bunch of things like write your essay by hand, and then you'll get into, you know, special needs situations where somebody writes very slowly. Um, you know, the starting at part, write part of it in class, et cetera. But I, I think there's another, I mean, the, that threat is real, and it's pervasive, and the educational system is going to have some earthquakes. But I think also, you know, the potential for, I, I'm, I'm a special needs parent, and sort of went through the whole K through 12 thing. The potential for this in terms of different kinds of assistance that the kids have not gotten is huge. And so one of the most, um, one of the most, I think, productive ways to do it in terms of education is like what, how, how can we get people to achieve their potential through this technology? Um, and that might be a, might outweigh the, the earthquake over plagiarism. Yeah, you know, in what circumstances do we allow students to use calculators? And some we do and some we don't, right? In what circumstances do we allow students to use graphing calculators or computers or other sorts of technology? We try to figure out what sorts of skills we want them to have and we try to figure out whether or not using this tool is going to prevent them from acquiring those skills. But we shouldn't pretend as though these tools don't exist because being able to use these tools effectively is part of what we are actually trying to educate people to do.
So with every single technology, we figured out how to do it, but it was terribly inefficient, right? And that's where we are with current AI. It can do it, whatever that it is. It's terribly inefficient. We're now entering this era of figuring out how to do it better, more efficiently. But you bring up a good point. For those that don't know, the dirty little secret of all this AI is it takes huge amount of compute, huge amount of electricity, and huge amounts of carbon. How that's going to go down as we, get, as we do this better, no one really knows. It will probably go down, but it is, for now, at least a big concern. How much carbon are you willing to burn to play with ChatGPT and help it figure out how best to serve underserved kids, K-12? How, how do you balance these things? Back to, back to legislation and regulation.